Hey, thank you all for joining. Uh, this is another free training uh, by Tigera. Today, we're going to talk about Calico Enterprise Multi-Cluster Management. Um, I'm Jonathan Sabo. I'm a senior uh, architect at uh, Tigera, and it is January 2021. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the project Calico, but if it's your first time uh, joining us or hearing about Calico, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, the project Calico, it's a community, it's the community that develops and maintains uh, Calico and Calico is uh, an open source networking and uh, network security solution for uh, Kubernetes. It allows you to uh, provide connectivity and network security, observability, troubleshooting, traceability. Uh, for uh, container workloads deployed to Kubernetes, virtual machines, and then also bare metal nodes or VMs outside of Kubernetes clusters. Uh, Project Calico, uh, we have uh, well over 150 uh, developers who've contributed to Project Calico. Uh, you can find us at uh, github.com forward slash Project Calico if you're interested in contributing. Um, you were also on Twitter at Project Calico. And uh, if you want to, uh, if you have questions or you need some help uh, with your, your Kubernetes cluster, or specifically with Calico, or you just kind of want to follow along and see what everybody else is doing, you can join us at uh, Slack or our Discord, um, uh, slack.projectcalico.org or discuss.projectcalico.org. There's probably 4,000 to 5,000 different uh, Kubernetes operators on our Slack. Uh, we just joined like Pound uh, uh, Kubernetes. <clears throat> uh, there's a, a different channels for different topics. Uh, there's a lot of people in there, a lot of people who are running Kubernetes in production. Uh, and also uh, I, I'm in there. Uh, a lot of our uh, engineering team is in there uh, throughout the day, answering questions and trying to help people as time permits. Um, Project Calico, it's by far the most widely deployed CNI across Kubernetes. I think Datadog produced a, a report recently that showed uh, how the like the most used CNIs and um, Project Calico is uh, ubiquitous in the space. We power well over 150,000 um, to 200,000 known clusters. Well over a million nodes are powered by Calico every day. It's uh, very widely used, battle hardened, and uh, and and tested, and something that uh, a lot of different organizations uh, rely on uh, for their Kubernetes workloads. Uh, today's agenda, we're going to go over uh, multi-cluster management, just a little bit of a, uh, an overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, multi-cluster management federation for Kubernetes. Uh, there's probably, there's like three main like, key pieces for multi-cluster management. Uh, the ability to manage um, uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters through a single pane of glass, um, being able to give you that visibility and traceability and being able to do that all from a single UI. Uh, and then also uh, Calico Enterprise has some functionality that allows you to uh, extend uh, the label-based policy management across uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. And we also have the ability to, well, built on top of the uh, of federated endpoint identity, uh, we have the ability to federate services. So you can have services that span multiple clusters. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to probably demo uh, the first two today. Uh, the we have um, done this uh, training before, and we're going to today we're going to be working in Azure. Um, uh, we're going to uh, be going through that for that uh, fourth bullet uh, there. So we're uh, if you want to follow along, uh, you can do so on uh, github.com forward slash Tigera Solutions forward slash Azure AKS MCM Federation. I'll paste the link into the um, into the chat in just a minute. Um, before we get started, though, uh, if you have questions, feel free to uh, post them into the chat or to ask in the Q and A uh, Zoom thing. I'm uh, not really skilled with Zoom, so I'll probably just uh, be watching these and, and then verbally answering them. And it looks like we've already got a question. So let me take care of the first one and then we'll uh, proceed into the agenda. Uh, the first question uh, is how support for VM and host is done that have no containers? Is it uh, VBS and VMware environment? Uh, Calico, uh, well, so being able to apply policy to VMs or hosts outside of Kubernetes, you install Calico uh, as an agent or a container on that host and Calico uh, can run and um, uh, secure that VM or that host uh, uh, the same way it does uh, a, a standard Kubernetes node. Uh, 
it connects into the control plane, which is your Kubernetes cluster, and then it can uh, apply policy using uh, labels that you uh, define for host endpoints. <clears throat> and then so you can use the same label based policy uh, for VMs and bare metal nodes outside of Kubernetes. And uh, what's cool is that this actually, you can define your policies and your, your label to create a label taxonomy, and you can use that in every cloud. So you could have VMs inside of uh, Google Cloud, Azure, AWS, and uh, or on-prem, and you can use the same policies everywhere. Hopefully that answers your, your question. Uh, so what is multi-cluster management? Well, it's a, it's a single management plane to scale security across all of your clusters. Uh, it's a it's a place for you to go in a central location to be able to uh, uh, to uh, visually manage and and um, and secure and uh, work on uh, your Kubernetes clusters and be able to 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 see the 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 network policies the um, uh, all the visibility tools via the the Calico Enterprise UI and you can add and join. Uh, uh, manage clusters to that single pane of glass and just centrally manage everything. Uh, it's also uh, has uh, a, some additional capabilities and we're going to talk a little bit about these um, today. We're going to do this is going to be our demo today. Uh, we're going to do uh, federated endpoint identity, federated services and federated policy. So federated endpoint identity, um, most most of the time, if you're, if you're dealing with a single Kubernetes cluster and you've installed Calico, uh, Calico is uh, maintains and manages the workload identity for that particular cluster. You define uh, standard Kubernetes uh, uh, using standard Kubernetes metadata labels applied to pods, labels applied to namespaces, labels applied to service accounts. You can target workloads inside of your cluster using those labels or combinations of those labels, and you could say, "Hey, I want to apply a network policy to this specific uh, uh, set of, of labels." And, and that will uh, follow the workload around from node to node as they're uh, uh, dynamically uh, orchestrated by Kubernetes and as they come and go. So it's dynamic policy enforcement for uh, Kubernetes workloads <clears throat> and, those, and uh, applied to those endpoints. Um, well, in the context of multi, multiple clusters, uh, you've got one or two or three or four or five uh, different Kubernetes clusters. We can actually extend that endpoint identity from uh, not just a single cluster, but across all the clusters. So the the labels that are applied to an end or to uh, a workload in cluster A will be known by cluster B, C, D, E, and F. And this allows you to um, have policy uh, uh, apply policy um, across clusters. So if you have uh, community or workloads that communicate across Kubernetes clusters, you can use the same label-based policy that you would for a single cluster across multiple clusters. Uh, and then building on top of that, your uh, Kubernetes services are basically their uh, Kubernetes uh, implementation of load balancers. And uh, most people are probably familiar with those in the context of a single Kubernetes cluster. Calico will allow you to uh, uh, extend services uh, and federate those across multiple clusters. And what this lets you do is you can have a, a federated service and you'll see the endpoints, not just for a single cluster, but um, all, of the, all of the endpoints across the, the federated, um, across multiple clusters that you, that you happen to set that service up for. And so if you've got a, a service in, uh, say you're deployed to AWS and you're in US East 1, or you're in US West 2, or you're in uh, another, another region, you can have, uh, as long as you have connectivity between your clusters and the, the pods or uh, the endpoints, the pods um, that are assigned IPs, they're routable, you can uh, extend services across those clusters. And this makes it really easy to foul over across region or to, uh, to, to scale your services across uh, either uh, in, a, in a single availability zone, across availability zones, across regions. And you can do that without the, the complexity or the um, performance uh, hit that you take when you use things like service meshes. Uh, it's a it's a really uh, interesting like superpower that Calico Enterprise uh, uh, has, and then we have the ability to apply policy across multiple clusters as well. Um, in in addition to that, we have centralized monitoring, alerting, authentication, and logging, and this is all built into uh, Calico Enterprise. Uh, so Federation for Kubernetes, uh, we talked a little bit about this a minute ago, it kind of uh, is built upon uh, two uh, additional 
uh, capabilities, federated endpoint identity, and this allows for the inclusion of remote cluster endpoints to be included in uh, the local cluster policy calculation. So you can take a, a set of Kubernetes clusters and you can set up federated endpoint identity and they subscribe to each other via the, the Kubernetes API and they're all aware of the endpoints deployed in the, the, uh, the, fe the federation of Kubernetes clusters. And this allows you to create a, a policy utilizing those endpoints. And then we also have federated services and federated services that extends the standard Kubernetes service and endpoints functionality across clusters. If you uh, run kubectl uh, get endpoints for a federated service name, you'll see not just the IP addresses of uh, a single uh, a Kubernetes cluster, but also but, but across all of the clusters in the federation. So federated endpoint identity. So each cluster in the federation, um, it, it acts both as a local and a remote cluster. Um, and the local clusters, they retrieve endpoint data from the remote clusters. The local clusters, they subscribe to all the other clusters inside of the federation and they pull that endpoint data locally. And that allows them to calculate policy and enforce policy in the, with the, the context of uh, the, the federation of clusters. Remote clusters, they, they allow the local clusters to retrieve the endpoint data. And that's secured uh, via uh, Kubernetes RBAC and uh, the, the Kubernetes um, uh, tokens. And you'll see, we're gonna run through this in just a, a minute. And what this enables is you to create policy uh, across multiple clusters. A lot of times uh, we'll work with customers that'll say, hey, I want to ensure that, uh, that um, workloads in my dev namespace can only talk to workloads inside of my dev namespace, but I want to make sure that that's, the, that's true across um, my 15 Kubernetes clusters. <clears throat> and that's the kind of um, uh, capabilities that uh, this enables. Uh, you, you can deny inbound traffic from all pods in a remote cluster, except for those within the same namespace. So you're kind of uh, extending the concept of, uh, of a namespace uh, across sets of clusters inside of a federation. And then federated services, uh, this extends the standard Kubernetes service, service and endpoints functionality across clusters. Um, and, and it enables you to provide uh, cross-cluster service discovery for local cluster uh, for your local cluster, um, and what and that's that happens. It uses the pod IP for the service endpoints inside of the remote clusters. As I was saying a minute ago, if you uh, if you're in your in your single cluster and you do kubectl get endpoints service name, you're only going to see the pod IPs that are behind that service inside of your uh, inside of one cluster. Uh, uh, Calco Enterprise Federated Services will allow that to span multiple clusters. You see the, the, the routable pod IPs, not just for a single cluster, but for uh, all the clusters inside of your, your federation. Uh, and, and this is used in conjunction with federated endpoint identity. So the first thing you do is set a federated endpoint identity, and then you can create services, federated services built on top of that. And, and, um, and this, is, uh, if this is optional. If you have an alternative uh, service discovery using console or something, uh, it, it can work with that as well. Uh, so Calco Enterprise Multi-Cluster Management, uh, what it really enables is, is centralized uh, control, faster cluster deployment, and uh, our, our multi-cluster management solution works um, uh, across all the different clouds and also on-prem. You can, uh, what you do is you designate a, a particular cluster as your management cluster, and then you can have managed clusters, and those managed clusters can exist in EKS, on uh, GKE, in AKS, or self-hosted inside of the public clouds or they could be uh, deployed on-prem or in the cloud using uh, Kubadium or Rancher or OpenShift or, or uh, VMware uh, 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 Tanzu. <clears throat> and, uh, and that allows you to, be, to have uh, your, your Kubernetes uh, deployment not only span uh, uh, availability zones or a particular region of a, of a specific cloud or in your uh, on-prem data center, but also multiple clouds. So you can truly become multi-cloud um, and, uh, and or hybrid uh, uh, deployments of Kubernetes. Uh, it gives you that, that single pane of glass to be able to centralize access control. And uh, so people are logging into one UI and they have the ability uh, at that one, that single pane of glass to be able to quickly browse and, and look across all the Kubernetes clusters that they have deployed. And, and, and that could be, like I mentioned, on-prem or ac across the, the various clouds. 
uh, we have some other uh, upcoming trainings and I'll just kind of make note of these as we, uh, and then we'll get into uh, the, the demo and kind of walk through like a, a real, uh, real example. So uh, February 2nd, we have uh, a new uh, talk on protecting against unpatched Kubernetes vulnerability. One of the ones that just came out, uh, CVE 2020-8554. Uh, and then we have on February 4th, we have in the EU time zone, uh, uh, troubleshooting microservices on Kates. And then February 9th, uh, deploying Calco on AKS, network security and uh, uh, scalability uh, considerations. February uh, 11th, enterprise security controls. And then on February 16th, we're gonna be um, announcing uh, a new product that's coming from Tigera, a very special product that will revolutionize security observability for Kate's networking. So definitely uh, check in with us on the, the 16th so you can uh, uh, be, you can see our, our brand new product that we're gonna be launching here uh, in the, in the new, next couple of weeks. Um, if you're interested in, in following on, on, along on the events, you can go to tigera.io forward slash events and you can uh, see all of the, the free training uh, that we post and new events as, as they come up. Uh, I just want to also bring your attention. Uh, we have uh, uh, a Kubernetes, uh, an introduction to Kubernetes networking ebook, and uh, you can download that for free. I'm going to email these. We'll be emailing out these slides to you, and also a link to the recording of today's training, so you can uh, you'll have these slides, and you'll be able to click on these links, and it'll take you right to the introduction to Kubernetes networking ebook. And also, uh, we also have a free training course that you can get certified, and you can become Calico certified. Uh, so uh, feel free to uh, uh, download the ebook, read through it, it's really good. And then uh, I welcome you to join us as uh, a Calico certified uh, Kubernetes operator. Uh, and feel free to send these to uh, your, your colleagues or friends. <clears throat> uh, and also I invite you to join uh, us. What we're gonna be doing today in just a moment is, is going through uh, multi-cluster management for uh, for Kubernetes, and this is a Calico Enterprise uh, capability. It's this is not available in the open source Calico, but you can try Calico Enterprise for free. You just go to uh, www.tigera.io, tigera-products forward slash get started, and you'll see a couple of different options. You can use our uh, completely hosted trial. It's like a sandbox trial for for three days or so, or you can actually join your manage your cluster as a managed cluster to our control plane. And then we, we host uh, the Calico Enterprise control plane and you add your, your cluster. It could be hosted in AKS, it could be a rancher cluster hosted on-prem. Um, and what it does is it connects out to uh, the, the control plane. And then you'll have the ability to go through our docs and test out what you're gonna see here in just a minute. All right, so let's get started. Let me start off by sharing this link into the chat. <clears throat> and uh, what we're going to do is kind of just walk through uh, the installation of a couple of different uh, Kubernetes clusters and uh, kind of go through the, the, uh, the training here. So um, I've done some of this stuff already. Uh, if we, if you, we all had to wait for me to install uh, uh, for AKS clusters, it would take too much time. So I've kind of gone through and, and done this. Uh, if you have uh, an Azure account, uh, you can follow along in Azure and these are pretty much copy paste uh, uh, inside of uh, assuming you've authenticated with your, your CLI. We also have uh, another uh, example of this in AWS. So if you don't have an Azure account, you can do the same thing in, um, in AWS with EKS. And the the, the reason we're doing this with AKS and EKS is because um, we're, we're using the, the Azure CNI in AKS and we'd be using the, uh, the um, AWS CNI in, in, in AWS via EKS. So you'd be launching an AKS cluster in Azure or an EKS cluster in AWS. And uh, one of the, uh, the benefits of uh, the Azure CNI and the, uh, the AWS CNI is when um, pods are instantiated, uh, those CNIs allocate routable IP addresses. And so if you've got multiple clusters and you've uh, created them with non-overlapping IP space or uh, your uh, non-overlapping uh, VPCs or VNets, you can have uh, routable connectivity between all of your Kubernetes clusters. 
Um, we're doing this in, in uh, these two clouds, but one of the, you can also do this on-prem with Calico. Calico has the ability to peer with top rack switches and be able to advertise that pod cider. So uh, we, we, you can do this in an on-prem environment. You can do this inside of the, uh, the public clouds. Uh, this solution will work in uh, all, all of these places. Uh, so what I've done uh, so far is I've gone through and I've created Azure research uh, resource groups in each region. Give me one second here. I think I'm going to, all right. I've gone through and I've created the, uh, the resource groups and you can see them here. We've got one for uh, East US, one for North Europe, one for West Europe and one for West US too. And these resource groups hold the resources that we're going to deploy into the cloud. Uh, one, we've, we started off by um, uh, deploying a couple of different uh, VNets. And what I'm going to do real quick here, open up another window, and we'll look at one of these real fast. Let's look at the ECUS VNet. And what I want to point out is the address space. You'll see that the ECUS is 10.0.0 slash 16. If we come back and we look at, say, North Europe, you'll see that the, the CIDR here, oh, this is the wrong file. Let's go look at the VNet, North Europe VNet. All right, you'll see it's 10.2.0.0 slash 16. So the four different VNets have non-overlapping uh, IP address space. And this means that, um, the, uh, that we'll be able to have routed connectivity between all the different VNets and our pods will be able to uh, pass packets across the, the Microsoft backbone. And then uh, I've deployed four clusters and I've done so using AKS engine. Uh, so this is actually uh, a self-hosted Kubernetes cluster inside of uh, uh, Azure, and it's not the managed service. Uh, and you can, uh, this is, you can do, I'm, I'm, if you're using a Mac, it's like probably brew install AKS engine, or if you just Google AKS engine, you'll see uh, uh, all about AKS engine, how that enables you to uh, define a, uh, a cluster declaratively and then use the tooling to quickly stand up and instantiate uh, the resources required for uh, that Kubernetes cluster. And you can kind of go through here. We've got, uh, it, it's a pretty um, uh, succinct definition of a managed uh, or a non or a self-hosted Kubernetes cluster inside of Azure. And then what I've, so I've done, I've, I've already deployed the resource groups. I've already deployed the, the VNets. These are like the VPCs in AWS, the VNets inside of Azure. And I've already deployed the Kubernetes cluster. I've also gone through and I've configured bi-directional peering between each region. And so I'll just kind of go through uh, what that is and then I'll show it to you. So inside each resource group, there is a VNet. And then if you go to the VNets peerings, you can add a peering. And then you can peer the VNets in both directions. And you want to do that for all the regions. And so what you'll have at the end when you're done is a full mesh. You'll have, and here, I'll just make this a little bit bigger. You're going to have a, a mesh connectivity. So you'll have um, East US will be able to talk to West US too. It'll be able to talk to uh, infrastructure inside of North Europe and also West Europe and then, and then vice versa. So it's, a, it's a, a full mesh connectivity between these VNets uh, deployed inside of uh, uh, Azure's uh, cloud. And so you see, if we come over here, you can see we've got the East US. If I take a look at the VNet and I look at the peerings, you can see it's peered to West US 2, North Europe and West Europe. And if I come back and I look at say West Europe 2 and I look at the VNet and I look at the peerings, you can see it's peered to East US, West US, and North Europe. So it's a full match between all the different uh, VNets. We have full connectivity between everybody. And then um, you wanna go ahead and deploy Calico Enterprise in each cluster. And there's a link here to install Calico Enterprise. I've also gone ahead and done this already. And we'll kind of go through this in a minute. I'll show you a little bit about uh, Calico Enterprise, multi-cluster management and our UI. <clears throat> so we've come, we've come this far. Uh, if you sign up for our trial or you uh, the, the hosted trial or uh, you decide to do the self-managed trial, you can you can participate and follow right along with us. It's a, it's a free thing you can sign up for. Um, and so let's take a look at this. So this is Calico Enterprise. This is the, the, the user interface that you get when you uh, sign up for Calico Enterprise. You'll see that you can see all of the Kubernetes um, network or the Calico network policies that are applied to this cluster. You can see all of the endpoints and endpoints are, are basically the pods that are running inside this particular cluster. 
And if you come, we take a look at a particular uh, workload running this cluster. You can see the pod, you can see the node that it's on, the IP address, the virtual ethernet pair that it has. You can see the namespace that it's in. You can see all of the labels. These are the labels that we use to target the workloads uh, and apply policy. And you can see all the policies that they have applied to this particular uh, endpoint. So this, these are the policies that uh, restrict and segment uh, workload inside of the cluster. You, know, you can also see the packets by policy. You'll notice everything is all green. This means that there's no denied traffic right now. And you can see down here, there's no denied bytes, no denied packets. And you can see the connections per second, allowed bytes and allowed package per second. And so you get um, all this telemetry for free out of the box. You also get um, uh, the CIS benchmarks. So if you want to know uh, how your, your cluster configuration stacks up to a uh, one of the uh, security standards uh, for Kubernetes, the CIS benchmarks, you can uh, get a heads up display uh, understanding of that. You can see that uh, the different um, um, it looks like I've, I've got one one that's uh, three that are uh, are uh, less than 50%. So it looks like I got I have some configuration management that I, I need to go do. Uh, if you see the policies, uh, one of the features of Calico Enterprise is this concept of a tiered policy model. Is as traffic comes in, um, policy is evaluated across tier. So uh, you can see that they're ordered. And so you can set up these tiers and the tiers are secured by uh, Kubernetes RBAC. So you can say, hey, I have a platform team tier and then a security team tier. And everybody in the platform team has RBAC um, rights to apply policy to the platform team tier. But the security team tier and the developers using the default tier, they can't override the policy because it's in a tier further to the left. So the platform team might create policies that protect the cluster and maintain the availability of the cluster. Things like uh, we want to make sure that no one blocks DNS in the cluster. No one prevents communication to the Kube API server, things that are going to uh, affect the availability of the cluster. And then they can delegate uh, responsibility of that the, 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 um, the policy enforcement and the segmentation between workloads down to the next teams. So it's a really good way to kind of uh, create uh, guardrails around network policy enforcement and to allow for like separation of duties. Maybe the security team uh, wants to ensure that workloads inside this cluster are never ever allowed to talk outbound to known bad IP addresses, like things like uh, command and control centers or malware sites, stuff like that. We're just not gonna let any workload that we deploy to this cluster ever send outbound connect connections to those workloads. Maybe we want to uh, quickly quarantine a workload if it starts misbehaving. Maybe a developer installed um, uh, some uh, a new web front end using NPM and they uh, and unfortunately NPM pulled down some uh, uh, backdoored uh, dependency, which is something that happens from time to time. And all of a sudden it's doing something it shouldn't. We've, we've noticed that because our policies were denying traffic. We saw this turn red and we wanted to uh, quickly uh, make sure that it wasn't allowed to move laterally inside of our cluster. So we're going to quarantine it. And you can do that by um, applying labels to workloads, things like that. And we want to, in this, that particular policy, it's in our security team tier because we don't want the developers to override it. So we give developers the ability to apply policy inside the default tier, and they don't have rights to apply policy in the security team tier. And the security team is over here on the left. So it, it's going to be enforced first that kind of stuff. And so th th these are the capabilities you get, some of the capabilities uh, with Calico Enterprise. And what's uh, really uh, uh, interesting and, and powerful is that uh, you, can, uh, you can quickly browse across cluster. So you can see that my, my management cluster is here. It's hosted in AWS. You probably recognize those host names. And then I can browse and manage uh, multiple clusters across the world. So you can see I've added um, uh, four, the four different managed clusters that are all hosted inside of different regions inside of Azure. And I can, I can manage and, and um, view the endpoints. You can see the nodes, the node names change. And you can see the IP addresses. You can see there's a 10.0.0. If I come to uh, North Europe, they're 10.2.0.0. If I go to uh, West Europe, they're 10.3.0.0. And if I go back over to West US 2, 10.1.0.0. So non overlapping, routable IPs across these four managed clusters. Um, and uh, you can see them here if we can expand them. <clears throat> and so it makes it really easy to uh, add add um, manage clusters to this uh, uh, 
this management, this control plane, and then you can uh, see all of the changes across uh, uh, the, the clusters over time. You have the ability to uh, visually inspect uh, flows. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, some visualizations that allow you to, um, to quickly uh, look across the cluster and you can see highlighted by namespace, by name or status, everything's all green. You can see like right now there's no denied traffic if there was, it would stick out like a sore thumb and you would know immediately, hey, there's something uh, that's uh, being denied inside this cluster. And this makes it really easy to kind of like gain like visibility into what's going on inside of uh, your your uh, Kubernetes workloads and kind of trace flows. So if I just come so like pick a, a particular flow, let's look at, um, I don't know, we'll look at the Kibana inside of here. And you can see that uh, this particular flow is uh, talking to one of the other endpoints. And you can see that it's green, green. This means that the policy is allowing outbound and it's allowing inbound on the, on the far side. And so when you're troubleshooting uh, connectivity uh, using your network policies and you wanna see, hey, why isn't this working? You can really quickly uh, visually uh, see that. We also give you uh, a centralized logging and monitoring um, in Kibana. And so the, the disk space and the, the, the logging and monitoring is all centralized inside of the management cluster. Um, if you wanna look and see if there's any denied traffic in the last uh, uh, 24 hours, you can see that we've got some denied flows. One of the other uh, benefits of Calco Enterprise is you get access to our uh, flow logs, which um, most flow logs are like the five tuple flow logs. You get like source IP, destination IP, source port, uh, protocol number. But as you know, in Kubernetes, the workloads are really are very ephemeral. So uh, having the IP address of a pod it isn't really helpful because pods come and go and the IP addresses change and that happens quite a bit. Kubernetes can be orchestrated. You imagine you have a, a hundred node cluster and you've deployed your, uh, your uh, awesome app to your, your hundred node cluster and it's running on 10 nodes and uh, Kubernetes is orchestrating that uh, application based on uh, available memory, CPU, the, the, um, the nodes might've died and so it's moving, it's terminating and reinstantiating that, uh, that, that workload across your cluster. And so if, for, uh, if, if uh, your security team came to you and said, hey, we found a vulnerability in Awesome App. We need you, there's a CVE in one of the dependencies. We need you to uh, patch it. And we also would like to know, hey, can you tell us if it's communicated outbound to any of these IP addresses? If, if all you had was the IP address information, the, the five tuple flows, and that note, that workload had been orchestrated across your 100 node cluster, you're not gonna be able to prove compliance. You need to have the additional Kubernetes metadata associated with those flows. Um, the, you need to have the labels, the source labels and the, the destination labels that are applied to that workload to know um, uh, whether or not traffic was allowed. And then also uh, what policies were applied at that time and whether or not that, that flow was uh, allowed or denied. So you get all that um, in addition to uh, some other, uh, you get all the DNS information inside of your cluster. Uh, we're monitoring all the DNS lookups. This can be really good for um, troubleshooting and monitoring and observability and like um, being able to, uh, to know like maybe you're incurring DNS latency or uh, maybe you have like uh, some, unfortunately a malware inside of your, your cluster and it's doing um, like, it has, it's utilizing a technique called domain um, generation uh, algorithms to be able to find the command and control center that will become uh, uh, blatantly obvious to you. You'll see uh, those pop up here in the external domains. Um, and so you get a, a lot of different uh, observability and visibility and traceability and manage, manageability across multiple clusters. All right, so that is just uh, Calico Enterprise multi-cluster management. Now let's get into federated endpoint identity. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is, so we're gonna set up and deploy Calico Enterprise Federation for Kubernetes. Um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to uh, apply uh, the Federation RBAC and then we need to create a service account for each cluster. And we're gonna use that to authenticate the different clusters inside of our, uh, our Federation. And we're gonna do this live, see how this goes. Let's make sure if I'm in the right window. All right, so and then we've got our four over here. All right, so the first thing I wanna do is hop into the right directory, Azure AKS MCM Federation. All right, all right, so let me come over here and try and copy paste this one more time. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to go for a region in East US, West US, North Europe, and West Europe. I'm going to export my kube config so it allow me to authenticate to each one of those clusters, each one of these clusters here. I'm going to talk to this one, and then this one, and then this one, and this one. Probably not in that order, though. And then I'm going to apply these manifests, the RBAC, and then the um, remote, uh, the, the create the service account. And what I'm doing really is following uh, these docs here. You can read more about the, um, the manage, and I'll just go ahead and toss this in the chat too. <clears throat> you can see the multi-cluster management. You can find out about uh, federated endpoint identity and services here. And so uh, what we're going to do is kind of go through like an abridged version of, of just following along on these docs. And if you sign up for the trial, you can do this in, on your own inside of your cluster. All right. Uh, so let me come back over here and let's copy and paste this. All right. And let's see if we can apply these YAML files to each one of these clusters. Hopefully uh, the internet gods are with us. It was just earlier this week, Verizon, or Ver, Verizon had an outage on the East Coast and wasn't, they didn't have any internet connectivity for, I don't know, like an hour or two. Um, and then what we wanna do is, so we've applied these manifests, we've created the RBAC uh, and the service account, and now we wanna run, uh, we're gonna create the kube configs. Uh, you can, this is kind of described in the, the docs. I made a, uh, don't laugh at my bash scripting, but I made a, a little script to make this faster. So we're not waiting around why I manually do this. And you can see it's uh, running through each one of the clusters, creating the kube config, and then it's testing connectivity. So it's trying, so we created a service account and then I, I'm grabbing that service account token and I'm authenticating with that token to the, the four different uh, uh, Kubernetes clusters. So, <clears throat> take my hoodie off. All right. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create our, our configure rem, uh, access to the remote clusters. We're gonna authenticate to the East uh, Coast cluster. We're going to create uh, a, a secret for, so we're gonna let the East Coast um, know how to authenticate to the West Coast, North Europe and West Europe uh, cluster. And then we're gonna create uh, the RBAC uh, for uh, uh, the cluster configuration are back uh, and then we're going to configure uh, the remote cluster configuration. This is like earlier in the slides, we talked about the concept of a local cluster and a remote cluster. So East Coast, the East US cluster is a local cluster, West US, North Europe and West Europe or, or West US, North Europe, West Europe are all remote clusters and the East Coast cluster is going to subscribe to those and download all of that um, and maintain that uh, uh, the endpoint identity on a, a regular basis for us. So let's roll through and do this for each one of these clusters. All right. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the, uh, the West Coast cluster, West US two. All right. And before I do this though, so this is East, this is East US, this is West US two. So let's, let me show you a little bit more about this. So let's look at uh, let's look at North Europe first. So this is Calico Q. This is one of our uh, CLI tools. We have uh, if you come here and you go to our install, somewhere in here is our CLI tools. Um, let me find it. Operations maybe. All right, CLIs. Yeah, and so you can see we got Calico Cuddle and Calico, Q, Calico Query. Um, uh, with the enterprise product, you don't need to use Calico Cuddle for a lot of things because we have an API server, an aggregated API server. Uh, but if you're not using Calico Enterprise, you're gonna you have to use Calico Cuddle. Um, uh, we give you if you that's one of the other benefits of Calico Enterprise. You get programmatic access via the API to all of the uh, custom resources. And then we have this tool here, Calico Query, that lets you query the endpoints. And you're gonna see here in just a minute that when we query uh, North Europe, you'll see that the workload endpoints, they're all local to the cluster. You'll see that they say Kate's demo pool. You'll notice that these are all uh, just the endpoints inside of North Europe. But a, a second ago, uh, we went through and we uh, configured um, a federation for the West Coast and the East Coast, I believe. So let's take a look at the endpoints for those clusters. Let's see if uh, what those look like. 
All right, you'll see that there's more of them. And you'll see that these have the, the cluster names. You'll see Calico Demo North Europe, Calico Demo West Europe, Calico, where is West US? You hear somewhere? West US too. All right, so you can see that the um, this, these, these two clusters are subscribed to the other clusters in the federation. And so we not only have the local cluster uh, workload endpoints available, we also have all the remote clusters too. And this is federated endpoint identity. This is what we use to be able to have like cross cluster policy. And this is what we use to build on top of to create um, federated services. So let me come back over here and let's finish this out. See if I can find my place. All right, so we did East Coast, West Coast. Let's do North Europe. All right, enter, enter. My keyboard, some of my keys are dying. I think I'm due for an upgrade. The delete key and C looks a little worn. All right, and then so let's do West Europe. All right. So now if we come back over here a minute ago, if we did North Europe, it only had its only its endpoints, but now you can see that it's got all the other clusters. So we've got four clusters, they're in a federation. They're all subscribed to each other's endpoint um, uh, identity via the, the Kubernetes API. Uh, Calico Enterprise is, is uh, ensuring that we've, uh, we're, the, the endpoints or identities being shared across these four clusters. And we've established routed connectivity uh, between the clusters, we're using the, uh, the, the Azure CNI. So the pods that get deployed to these clusters um, are gonna get routable IPs. So a pod in one cluster should be able to talk to a pod in another cluster across Microsoft's backbone. And so now we're gonna kind of prove that out and test that out. So let's deploy the demo use case to each region. So we're gonna go for a region in East US, East Coast, West Coast, North Europe, West Europe and we're going to uh, deploy a Ubuntu pod to each one of those. So let's go ahead and do that. And not this window. All right, let's go ahead and deploy that pod. <clears throat> All right, so now we've got a pod deployed to each one of the clusters in each one of our regions. And what we wanna do is we wanna open a shell in each pod, and then we're gonna to attempt to ping from one Ubuntu demo app to the other. And so let's do this. All right, let's come over here. And so these are the, the, the these are the four different clusters. This is East Coast, this is West Coast, this is North Europe, and this is uh, West Europe, I believe. Let's let's check. So Coo Cuddle uh, cluster. Info. All right, so we can see that we're talking to the control plane of the East uh, Coast cluster, the West Coast cluster, North Europe cluster, and then uh, the West Europe cluster. All right, so let's do this. That's not it. Come back over here, and what I'm gonna do is move this over here. Boom. So we're gonna, the first thing we wanna do is let's, let's see the pods and let's look at their labels. All right. So it looks like we've got a Ubuntu pod in each one of our four clusters. And you can see that it's got a label app Ubuntu geography US, geography US. This is geography EU, geography EU. This location is Virginia, shout out to Northern Virginia. This is uh, location Washington, not Washington DC, it's the other Washington over on the West Coast. And then uh, location, this is in Ireland and this is in the Netherlands. And so these are the different regions. These are actually the real locations of these uh, data centers where these um, Azure data centers where uh, Azure is hosted. So let's, So we can see that uh, we've got four Ubuntu pods in four different regions. And what we wanna do now is let's get into them. Um, let's do this real quick. All right. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna install some packages so we can ping across these. So let's do that. Come on, you bunch of package mirrors. All right. And then I'm gonna hit um, enter a couple of times. I'm gonna hop out of here because I want to get the pod IPs first. So let's do this. So could cuddle um, get pods minus go wide. Let's get the IPs. <clears throat> so you can see we've got uh, 10.0.0.70, 10.1.0.35. 
10.2.0.107 and 10.3.0.79. So non-overlapping uh, routable IPs. Let's hop back into these and let's see if we can ping them. Let's ping the East Coast. All right, looks like everybody can ping the, the East Coast. Let's ping the, uh, I don't know, which one's this? Let's ping the West Europe uh, uh, pod. All right, everybody can talk to everybody, <clears throat> I promise. All right, and so now what we wanna do, so, so basically we, we've um, deployed a pod to each one of our regions um, uh, and we have uh, non-overlapping IP space, we've got rival pod IPs, we've got full connectivity, we just use uh, ping ICMP uh, to prove that we've got connectivity across uh, the Microsoft backbone to one another. And now let's kind of, let's go through uh, an example use case of using multi-cluster management to, uh, to do something useful. We're gonna enforce, one, one of the, we're gonna enforce e, uh, an EU security criteria um, uh, policy called uh, GDPR. So general data protection uh, regulation, uh, data uh, residency requirements. So one of the GDPR uh, requirements is that if you're in the EU and your particular workload has it falls under GDPR's purview, you have to make sure that um, the data is is um, the da the data sovereignty requirement is enforced. Uh, workloads in the EU are only the data the data has to stay in the EU. Basically, you can't be sending data to the US or to Africa or some other place inside the world. It has to stay in the EU. That that's one of the security requirements for for GDPR. The other one that we talked about in the slides was like um, dev. We want to make sure that dev can only talk to dev. This is a little bit different example, and we're going to uh, go through that right now. So let me come back over here to this other window, and we're just going to clear this. And let's look at the the, the, <clears throat> the Ubuntu pods. So there's, there's four uh, different um, .yaml files that define the pods for the different regions, and you can see that they have different labels. So we've got App Ubuntu East US, Virginia US, Dev. Uh, App Ubuntu North Europe, Ireland, EU, Prod. App Ubuntu West Europe, Netherlands, EU, Dev. Uh, App Ubuntu West US to Washington, US, Prod. So what we've done is we've created this label tax the taxonomy that allows us to, uh, to uh, slice and dice and, and do micro segmentation of our Kubernetes workloads, not only inside of a single cluster, four different clusters in this example. And you can see if I wanted to create a policy that applied to the workloads for every one of these clusters, I could use app Ubuntu. If I want to create a policy that applies just to the East Coast cluster, I could use region East US. If I want to um, target the United States, I could say ge geography uh, US. If I want to target the, the, um, the uh, European clusters, I could say ge geography EU. If I want to um, target the, the release stage dev, I could do release stage dev. And you can see that, that go, there's one in the US and there's one in the EU. And then prod is there's one in the EU and there's one in the US. So you can create sets of labels to be able to segment your workloads. And as I mentioned earlier, you can do this with um, Kubernetes workloads, Kubernetes workloads across multiple clusters, VMs and bare metal nodes as well. All right, so we've gone over the labels. Let's come back over here. And now what we're gonna do is uh, we're going to, we're gonna um, deploy uh, some settings to Felix, which is our Calico agent that's a uh, Calico node. We're gonna create some tiers and then we're gonna create uh, some network policy. Before we do that, let's look before, let's go ahead and look at this real quick. So this is my management cluster. But if we look at the East Coast cluster, this is just like what you get for the default install. The allow Tigera tier, this is kind of like our break glass tier. It, it makes sure that we don't break the, uh, the cluster or the UI's ability to talk to the cluster. And we'll just kind of go through and take a look and you see, you know, run through each one of these clusters. So this is, this is how easy it is to manage network policy across sets of clusters via the UI. So you can see that there's currently uh, only these two tiers here. And uh, what we're gonna do now is install some other uh, tiers and some network policy. So let's go ahead and do that now. Come back over here. All right. And the Felix configuration that I'm, uh, the, the settings I'm toggling 
are around how often uh, flow logs show up inside of uh, my uh, my centralized logging my in, my in my management cluster. All of the remote clusters, all of the managed clusters log back to the management management cluster. And I want that to happen in 10 seconds. The default is like five minutes. And if we're looking at it, I don't expect everybody to wait around five minutes to see uh, an allow or deny flow. We'll just speed that up a little bit for uh, demo sake. So now let's go back over here. Let's take a look at um, the East Coast cluster. You can see now we've got a platform team tier. It's got a policy that allows cluster DNS. And you can see that it's passing traffic over here, passing the next tier. And then we've got a, um, a compliance controls tier. And we have a policy that enforces GDPR data sovereignty. Let's take a look at that. So this policy, it's a uh, scope globally. That's one of the other th benefits of Calico network policy compared to Kubernetes network policy. Calico network policy, it can be applied to a particular namespace, but can also be applied globally to the entire cluster. And that's what we're doing here. So the enforced GDPR data sovereignty uh, policy in the compliance controls tier, that means that if I'm in charge of compliance controls, I can create a tier for our, my team. I can define policy in it and I can create Nate Kubernetes RBAC that says, hey, we're the only people that are gonna be able to manage these network policies. The developers and the ops teams aren't gonna be able to override our policies. We need to be sure that our GDPR compliance is enforced. This applies to the entire cluster. And what we're doing is we are, uh, we've got applied ingress and egress rules, and we're denying um, any access from endpoints that are, that are um, not equal to EU to endpoints that are uh, uh, geography equals EU. And then we're on an outbound, we're denying um, any access uh, from endpoints that equal the EU. So if you're, if you're, if you're trying to send traffic outbound and you are, from the EU, you're not allowed to send them to endpoints that are not in the EU. So basically, um, we're going to make sure that the EU, the EU clusters and the EU workloads are, can talk to each other, but they can't talk to the US. So US can talk to US and EU can talk to EU. And uh, we're ensuring that the data sovereignty requirements are enforced. And we'll just come through and we'll just make sure that these are applied to the North Europe cluster, the West Europe cluster, and also West US too. All right, looks like we're good. Let's go back to the East Coast. All right, so now let's uh, come over here in the, and we want, we've already taken a look at the policy. This is the YAML representation of the policy. One of the cool things about um, Calico Enterprise is you can come in here and actually edit the policy um, uh, using our, uh, our UI makes it really easy. If you're not comfortable managing uh, YAML or you haven't memorized the Calico uh, syntax, uh, then uh, uh, welcome to the club. You can use the the uh, the, the web user or the web UI to uh, manage policy and create policy, and then if you want, you can actually download it as as YAML, and then uh, and then manage it via your favorite editor. I probably have a new version. Oh wow! This is the first time that there hasn't been a new version of code that I haven't installed yet. Um, and yeah, and then so you can edit it via your UI, and then and then uh, commit that back into to Git using uh, use like you, and then use a CI CD. GitOps workflow if you want to apply policy to all your clusters. All right, so all of them have been deployed. All right, so now we want to hop back in here. So we're already in our shell. We applied our policy, and we've uh, we have. Um, let's do this. I'm gonna hop back out of here. I'm gonna get the pods IP again, and I'm gonna hop back in. So now let's try to ping the East Coast from all the clusters. And you'll see the um, over here on the left, the East Coast can talk to West Coast, but uh, North Europe can't talk to East Coast or and neither can West Europe. Let's can you control C. Let's see about who can talk to uh, North Europe. All right, so North Europe can talk to North Europe and West Europe can talk to, to West Europe, but the East Coast clusters and the West Coast cluster cannot. But come up here, let's get the, the West, Europe cost or pod IP. So let's try this again. Ping, let's ping West Europe. All right, and again, North Europe can talk to West Europe, but uh, West Coast United States and East Coast United States are out of luck. And so if we stop there and we come back over to the uh, Kibana and I go to management cluster, we look at here and let's look at the flow logs. With any luck, Let's look here, like the last 15 minutes, maybe. Let's see if these, these flows show up here. 
sometimes it takes a second, but it looks like we're good. So we can see here that flows. So this is the flow. The destination is West Europe. You can see 10.3.0, the destination is West Europe. And this was denied. And the source here is Virginia. So the source is the East Coast cluster. It's trying to talk to the West Europe cluster. And the enforced GDPR data sovereignty policy is denying that flow. And we've got all of the uh, labels applied to this, the source and the destination. So if our security team came and said, hey, six months ago, did we have any communication from uh, the Europe to uh, the United States? Did we violate our GDPR compliance? You can say, no, we did not. We had Calico Enterprise installed. We had a, a policy that enforced data sovereignty and we can prove that any of those flows were denied. Uh, let's come down here. And uh, we're at time. Uh, we also have a uh, multi-cluster management use case for multi-region service failover. And we can do that without the, um, well, the performance that you take by using things like service meshes without the complexity of having to set up a service mesh. Uh, you can do all that uh, uh, very simply with Calcor Enterprise. And you can try that all out uh, on your own. If you go to tigera.io uh, forward slash tigera forward slash or hyphen products forward slash get started. And I encourage you to do that. Um, Join us on Slack and uh, 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 hit us up. Uh, send us. Uh, uh, hit, we're also on uh, LinkedIn, uh, uh, Tigera and Calico. So uh, please join the community. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm gonna answer. Let's see if we have any questions here. So does MC uh, does MCM use Cluster API project? No, it does not. It does not uh, use the Cluster API project. Uh, one of the other questions is from. Um, how do you handle log data if it is a lot? Are there wrap offload options? Um, yeah, so how you architect your multi-cluster management setup um, is something that like our, our customer success team works on a lot. First of all, we've got like um, uh, some calculators that kind of uh, can calculate the total amount of flows based on the, to the workloads. So we can let you know like how much, first of all, how much disk space do you need inside of your cluster? Um, um, what, what, all the other consideration is what is the retention period for your logs, your, uh, your flow logs, audit logs, um, DNS logs, BGP logs, how long do you need to keep them around? Calico Enterprise is, we're not building a data lake. Um, uh, we, we're kind of, it's kind of around to, uh, make things operationally useful. And then you can archive them off to uh, long-term storage via syslog, via Splunk, via Fortinet's, uh, Fortisim, um, other, uh, also Sumo. Um, and, and some other, anything that supports syslog. Uh, so if you, if you have a SOC that uh, is already managing like security events, you can send it off to there and you can have like a short retention period. Um, also, if you are shipping, uh, if you've got a lot of remote regions and you're shipping, um, you've got a lot of activity, a lot of churn, you might decide to localize your management cluster in closer to uh, those managed clusters, especially if you have lots of clusters. Maybe you put a management cluster inside of a particular region and that management cluster manages all of the managed clusters in that region, uh, things like that. Uh, so there, there are some like architectural uh, uh, nuances to how you set things up. And one of the, if you come out and you choose to buy Calico Enterprise, you benefit from all of our experience with uh, all of our customers that we have and all of the, the we've been doing this for years. So uh, we would help you with that kind of, uh, gladly. So uh, that's it. This is, uh, we're at 202. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate uh, your attention. Uh, join us on uh, the next uh, uh, events that we have coming up. Uh, hopefully you found uh, this uh, useful. Uh, yes, this is support for GCP, uh, every cloud, every cloud, every distribution. And thanks again.